And I'm thrilled to invite you, not invite you, but welcome you here this afternoon uh, to this very special presentation by Helen Morrissey. Uh, we've been waiting about a year for you to come. It's been a while to get the scheduling to work, and we're thrilled. Uh, Helena has broken one of the most hard barriers in the world. She's a fixed income manager who runs an equity shop, uh, which is in terms of this world is, and she's also happens to be a woman who's a CEO, which is also a, a rare thing. Now, a few weeks ago, we had Deborah Spar here who talked about this problem of teens. And it wasn't about teenagers, although they have problems of their own, for those of you who have parents, who are parents of teens. But this phenomenon that in area after area, the fraction of women leaders uh, uh, in professions like partners in law firms, partners in accounting firms, uh, many other fields, and in boards, seem to be stuck in the middle of the teens, somewhere in the teens. And it's also true, sadly, in business schools. It's a problem that I face as a dean. Now, a lot of people have diagnosed this problem, have calculated the numbers about this problem, and said, this is an awful thing. But very few have done much about it. Uh, and our guest tonight has, in fact, done a great deal about this. Uh, and we're, I don't want to, she will, will, of course, describe what, what she and her friends have done over the last few years. And it's nothing short of amazing. Um, so I'm thrilled to, to introduce Helen Morrissey, who's going to talk about the 30% club journey so far. But I think we have yet to see a lot more. So thank you very much for coming. Thank you so much, Peter, and it's a great pleasure to be here. I'm slightly in awe of the title Distinguished Speaker series, and I hope I live up to the billing, uh, but it really is a great pleasure to be here. And I am also very must acknowledge right at the start that we have a fantastic relationship between the 30% Club and Saeed, um, who, uh, well, I'd better not steal my own thunder. I'll more on that later. Um, now, obviously, I've been asked to, this evening to give a talk, um, but I'm very conscious that there has been already a lot of talk for many, many years about the lack of women at the top of organizations around the world. And obviously, we just heard that you had a talk from Deborah just a couple of weeks ago on the subject. So I think at this stage, we're kind of a bit impatient, don't want to talk so much about it as to see real signs of a breakthrough. And I'm delighted that this evening I'll be able to share at least a breakthrough in one part of the, uh, the efforts. Um, and I want to talk about you know, what's led to that breakthrough, because I do feel very optimistic that we can uh, use some of the lessons learned, some of the lessons that I have learned, this wasn't things that I, I foresaw that would happen, um, and perhaps it will be useful um, to help women, but also other under groups of underrepresented people at the top of organizations to fulfill their career potential, but also I think quite critically do it in their own way, um, and in so doing also make our organizations better. So now the 30% Club launched um, about four, four and a half years ago. Um, and at the time, uh, so November 2010, at the time, there were 12.5% uh, women on FTSE boards, um, the biggest 100 companies in this country, of course. And our simple, albeit big ambitious, um, target was to see 30% women on those boards by the end of this year. Now, in the space of the four years, I haven't got many charts, don't worry, I'm not going to be giving a PowerPoint, but I had to put up this one because it is so gratifying, really. Um, and you'll see, obviously, from the shape of the line, how slow the progress had been over the preceding decade or longer. But you've seen, since we launched in 2010, at about 12.5% women on boards, and the last reading actually was November of last year, there'll soon be a recount, then we see the real pickup in uh, the pace of change, and now at 23%. Now, at the same time when we launched, there were 21 all-male boards in the FTSE. And if you looked at the next 250 companies, um, over half of them were women-free boards. Let's put it like that. Um, fast forward to now, and there are now no all-male boards in the FTSE. And you can imagine just how fierce the competition was not to be that very last one. That was almost quite amusing to watch. Everyone falling over themselves, rushing around to find any old woman, basically, to put on the board. <laughs> not quite as bad as that, but you got a sense of desperation. And then if you look at the 250, where they started a much worse place, then that 131 all-male boards is now only 24. Now, in four years, that is an amazing uh, amount of change. Now, to be honest, what's been even more exciting than that has been seeing over that relatively short space of time in the context of cultural shifts, a, a complete mindset change around the issue. So that now in British businesses, this is no longer seen as a special interest or a diversity issue, but as a mainstream business issue. It's part of having a modern, successful 
business culture for the future. And I guess what I have to admit at the start is that the reason why we've seen that change is because business leaders, who are obviously mostly men, got behind this issue. And so um, to use Emma Watson's phrase, this has you know, literally been he for she in action. So how did this all come about? Um, well, I'll start back at the beginning, but not right, right back, don't worry. Um, and just explain how it came uh, to set up the 30% Club and, and what, uh, you know, to be honest, it was driven out of frustration that, um, as already Peter has said, we were seeing very little in terms of progress, notwithstanding a huge amount of effort. Now, I started my career a long time ago, um, and I was, um, I'm a fund manager, and um, joined a firm and, and, and thought, naively as I now realize, that actually the world of work was a world of equal opportunity. I thought that how hard you worked and your aptitudes would determine how far you would go. So I was very disappointed, like some of you might have been, to discover that my gender was an issue. And in my case, it was a pretty overt um, signal because I had my first child when I was about 25 years old, came back from maternity leave and was passed over for promotion. And I asked my boss, actually that child is sitting right there, it's slightly embarrassing for him, isn't it? But anyway, <laughs> um, I was passed over for promotion and I asked my boss, what was I doing wrong? What should I do differently? And um, he said, well, you know, there's some doubt over your commitment now, you just had a baby. Nobody would ever say that now, but in, you know, to be honest, I was a, well, I was shocked, but also I was quite um, grateful because I knew where I stood. And what did I do? Well, the term hadn't been, I mean, I was one woman out of a team of 16 fixed income fund managers. Uh, the term hadn't been invented then, but effectively I leaned in big time. I, um, I did move a couple of years later to a more entrepreneurial, smaller firm. Um, I sat at every table. I took a, every opportunity uh, that came my way. And to be honest, when one didn't, I sort of tried to create one. Um, at the same time, I also had more children, and um, my own juggling act was made easier, or hugely easier, when my husband, who was a freelance or was a journalist, decided he would go freelance when we had our fourth child. Um, but it was obviously a, a, lot of, a lot of work still for all of us. Then um, a real sort of change thing happened for me, an opportunity arose when I was 35 years old. Uh, by then, I had, my husband and I had five children. Uh, the youngest had just had their third second and first birthdays, respectively, so it was a fairly full-on time at home. And then I had a wholly unexpected opportunity to become the chief executive officer of the firm Newton that I had joined just seven years before. Um, now, to be honest, um, this was less a question of leaning in than diving in headfirst. Um, and I wouldn't necessarily advocate it. I mean, I had no business experience, no management training. I was a bond fund manager and suddenly being asked to lead the company which had 20 billion pounds of money under management at the time. But I did realize it, it was a, a big opportunity, um, and I did say yes. But obviously, um, and I feel, you know, well, lucky, um, but also, um, you know, looking now, I, I've survived. I'm still here. Um, it wasn't necessarily a textbook example of how to become the CEO. Um, Newton is thriving. It now manages over 50 billion pounds. And my husband and I now have nine children, ranging in age from six to 23. So um, it all kind of has worked out. Um, but um, I feel that I have been fortunate in my choices because uh, fund management, although there aren't that many women in fund management, is a very results-based career. So if you perform well, your funds perform well, then that really speaks for itself. It's not a question of ours at the desk. And running the business is the same. If the profits grow, if clients are happy, then again, you, you, your results speak for themselves. And I also, of course, have a very supportive husband. Um, but over the time, even though I was focusing those first 15 years, I guess, of my career, really on delivering those results, both as a fund manager and then as CEO, I obviously became gradually aware that younger women were coming up to me and particularly asking about how did I juggle family and career. And I realized I wanted to help. I wanted to help them feel less uncertain about their ability if they wanted to combine both. I would never prescribe one or the other or both. It's a personal thing, but if people want to do that, I wanted to help. And I wanted to ease their journey, make it easier perhaps than mine had been. So I did what lots of other people have done. I set up a women's development network group within my company. Um, by this stage, I was um, co-chair of the parent company of Newton, uh, BMY Mellon 
colleagues sitting here. Oh, and um, I actually had, it was like one of those things at the moment, we've evolved since then, but at the time I was described as co-chair of the rest of the world, you know. There was America and there was the rest of the world. So I had a big, you know, big remit, big uh, set of countries to play with and set up this women's development network. But in all honesty, um, and we had lots of events and we always invited men and people said how inspiring, but I became quite disillusioned because it didn't seem to actually inspire anybody to do anything. We were still stuck at maybe 10%, maybe 15% women at the top in the senior committees. And so, I mean, I was at a loss really and was quite um, thinking that my efforts really weren't, you know, wasn't really much point doing it. Uh, then I was invited to a lunch where there were probably about 15 different companies represented and, and academics as well. And as we talked around the room, I realized that some people had been working at this A a lot longer than I had, but also had also not seen any results. And as I came away from that lunch, I thought, well, we just must be doing something wrong. I mean, if we're spending so much time with so little uh, results, um, then clearly our, uh, our efforts are misplaced. But I didn't know exactly what that was, of course, and read widely at the time on the subject, and sort of gradually two ideas occurred to me. One was that we needed a measurable goal. We tended to have these women's networks and got a bit of confidence from talking to each other, but we didn't actually sort of track our progress. And of course, I run a business against measurable goals, and um, I'm very anti-mandatory quotas. I feel we need to own an issue, and it needs to be sustainable, and we're also, I'm not interested in just having a few token women on the top, I want to have change at all organizational levels and for all companies. Um, but having an objective that you measure your progress against, having a deadline, 30% by the way is the critical mass point. It's a stepping stone obviously on the way to full parity, um, but it's a, um, you know, it's, it's a big jump from where we were at the time. Secondly, we needed to involve those in power more. We had been spending too much time women talking to each other. and. As I mentioned, the initial objective, we're now right the way through, and I'm going to talk about how we, how we look today, but um, the initial objective was about the boardroom. So, of course, the, the powerful people on the board are the chairman of the board. We needed to get the chairman of the board to support this initiative, to drive the initiative, to lead it. Um, and so uh, I didn't know how they would react, but I knew a couple reasonably well. Uh, Sir Roger Carr, who was then chairman of Centrica, and Sir Wim Bischoff, who was chair of Lloyds Banking Group at the time, what they thought of the idea of a campaign led by them, or people like them, to um, create more gender balance on boards. And to my delight, of course, um, both of them immediately said yes. They said, look, we've been really frustrated by not being able to find women uh, to put on our boards, but actually we have seen the impact, the positive difference that having women on our boards has made to the conversation, to the boardroom dynamic, to the challenge. They often said to the behavior of the men, but I didn't like to pursue that too much, but they said it's a different place, it's a better place, so we get better results. And of course, um, uh, you know, where they led, others followed, and within a few months we had just seven still, small group, of founding chair supporters and we launched in November 2010 as I mentioned and um, of course that quickly spawned others you know inspired others to join um, and these are men who obviously enlightened they're doing it for though for their businesses uh, this is not a quota as I say this is actually because they are saying we want to change we want to accelerate the pace of progress and often they are doing it because they're looking at their daughters as well and seeing that they're seeing a divergence between their son's careers and their daughters the third ingredient that I actually wasn't conscious on my part, but I now realize was a very critical part of what's happened since, is um, we were very open um, about how we were actually going to achieve um, uh, these objectives. So, in fact, at the time we were quite roundly criticized. One, um, the Evening Standard wrote, um, well, 30% club, it sounds a very worthy thing to do, but actually it's hopelessly vague about what it's, how it's going to achieve this. But I now recognize that the vagueness was good because we weren't trying to follow a well-trodden path. We were trying to, we needed to, because the old path hadn't worked. We needed to create a new route. We needed to develop a new map to get to the destination. And we, we also aren't a diversity business. This is a group of business leaders just determined to see results and over a short space of time. So we want to collaborate with everybody. We want to work with everybody doing great things in this space already. 
we wanted to fill gaps where there was nothing happening and provide some cohesion to fragmented efforts, both of which have been quite important, I think, in terms of galvanizing and, and getting a focus around the issue. Um, but to say we were open source and very collaborative. So now we have, we've got some great partnerships. Um, we do work very closely with Lord Davis, who um, about six months after we launched, uh, wrote his Women on Boards report for the government. And we collaborate, because obviously a government commission report doesn't then have resources and actions behind it. It recommends things, and we've been working very closely with Lord Davis, um, who I had known before, and we've, we've sort of tag-teamed on the thing, really, in terms of how to deliver against his, his 10-point plan. We also now have programs where there are I'm going to sound slightly exhausted when I say this now. There are 19 uh, work streams within the 30% Club. We go from schoolroom to boardroom. This is not a one-woman show. Brenda Trenodon, who leads on our business school efforts and is working with Saeed, um, has been a member right from the, from the start. She brought her whole family. just shows how dedicated she is to the cause here. Um, sorry for that. But <laughs> so, and, um, you know, it's probably about a thousand people now working on this in the UK. And these are people at the top of their career. They are people of influence. It's men and women, very important. It's men and women working together. And, and it's with a huge sense of absolute determination that we are going to get these results. And we're kind of past talking about it. Um, one of our um, important relationships is with Saeed Business School that generously offers a scholarship on its executive MBA program. I don't know if Arifa is in the room. Arifa, sorry. Um, winner of this current cohort's um, scholarship, Metals Trader, youngest recipient so far of uh, a 30% Club uh, Business School scholarship. Um, and we are also working, we had a, um, a panel discussion today about our next cohort, Kathy Harvey from Said and Arifa both spoke at a 30% Club seminar, Nurturing Female Talent in December, and it's all very joined up. We're trying to create a real sort of sense of a continuum of change. One of the things we've done most recently that I'm very excited about is that we now have a collaboration with Speakers for Schools. Um, some of you may have come across this. It's a fantastic organization set up by Robert Peston, who is the BBC economics editor, and it offers free talks to state schools around Britain. And in January, um, 20 of our chairmen gave talks in uh, state schools around the country. It's an ongoing part of the program now. I mean, I, in fact, I gave a talk, and mine was at a boys' school. It's not just about, again, going out to talk to women about gender equality and about encouraging um, us to value each other and respect each other. And what we're now seeing is, say, is this continuum of, of change. Um, more uh, very recently as well, we've had, I'm sort of slightly hesitant about mentioning this because it's piloting at Cambridge, but we are doing a, um, we've done a student aspiration survey to see again how female students' career aspirations might diverge from their male counterparts as they go through the university years. We're trying to keep pinpointing at what stage does that divergence or those <coughs> doubts set in that do hold women back. A thousand students at Cambridge um, completed the survey. We're analyzing them right now. On 9th of May, March, we'll be unveiling uh, the results and um, we uh, will roll it out to other universities, obviously including Oxford. Um, if it tells us some interesting things, there's a cross-company mentoring program um, that involves 22 organizations, including some in the public sector. And this is where mid-career women who are often seeing um, or encountering difficulties in getting as far ahead in their careers as their male colleagues um, have a, a mentor from another organization. And when we ran it in pilot, because I wasn't sure if the world needed yet another mentoring scheme, the women said it was very liberating being mentored by somebody outside their own organization. And the mainly male mentors, two thirds of our mentors, this current cohort are men, so they opened their eyes to what was really going on with probably the women in their own company who would be not telling them directly. Um, I kind of try to live and breathe this in, in terms of every, everything that we do, obviously, at Newton, but, and I can't let the moment go without mentioning you know, that I've become also quite um, concerned about very subtle differences in our education system, and including, actually, the lack of um, team sports in girls' schools. I have six daughters of the nine, and as they hit the public examination years at schools, I've noticed that the sporting opportunities, particularly team sports, really dry up. Whereas my sons have been chucked out on the pitch, see more, more often as they hit the exam times. And it's one of the reasons, because I do feel that the life lessons learned, you know, being 
playing sports as part of a team, you know, being dependent upon, depending on others, savoring victory and then learning how to cope with the disappointment of defeat are really important skills that therefore women might start their careers slightly disadvantaged by not having. It's one of the reasons why Newton is very proud to sponsor the women's boat race. Um, BMY Mellon sponsors the men's and I'm sure you all know that on the 11th of April this year, then thanks to all of this and lots of um, support and encouragement from the universities, uh, we're going to have the 161st men's race on the tideway and the first women's race on the tideway. So it takes a while sometimes, you know, to get there, but we must celebrate these, um, these moments. So 30% club now, I mean, I suppose what I now think of as well is that perhaps this focus initially on the boards and seeing uh, what happens there, it's like a microcosm of now I think, I realize it's, there's an antiquated world of work. So it's kind of the start, not the end of the journey. And actually in the quarter of a century since I've been working, it's amazing really how little has changed. Um, I still work pretty much, although I obviously use computers and so forth, but um, you know, most of my colleagues and myself work more like our parents did than you would expect in a world where globalization and technology has changed just about everything else. So of course we go and sit at the same desk usually, we do the commute to work, and most people, if they do work flexibly perhaps, then it's treated as an employee perk rather than just working in a smart way. Now, your generation presumably is expecting something quite different because um, you've grown up with the internet, you've grown up thinking that actually you can make an intellectual contribution anytime, any place, anywhere in the world. And I think business is only just starting to kind of get to grips with what actually really needs to happen in a big way. And that might make a huge opportunity for not just women, but for everybody to have a different sort of balance in their lives between the work uh, that they do and, and the rest of their lives. Um, I think as well that those two big trends of globalization and um, technology have perhaps spawned a third, which might not be talked about quite so much, but is a sort of breakdown of traditional power structures, the command and control structures. That obviously now everyone has an opinion and can put it out there on the internet. And we're seeing, you know, I read about the other day that something in the subtitle was being in charge is not what it's used to be. I mean, you cannot tell people what to do in the same way as people used to be able to. A great friend of mine, Julie Meyer, who's an entrepreneur and investor, she wrote a book, Welcome to Entrepreneur Country. And in it, she talked about how uh, in a networked world, the qualities that we might typically associate with women, uh, collaboration, transparency, um, uh, consensus building, are becoming more valuable because, of course, they are the things in a networked world and influencing is more of a different type of influence. Now, I think that this is a big... Um, theme or will become a big theme as she has a whole chapter that's all about the world is becoming more feminine place. Um, now of course men can have some of those qualities too, I don't wish to upset anybody but it's just that women are wired in a way and this is not stereotype thinking, it's neuroscience, uh, at least current neuroscience thinking that, that women are more naturally inclined to that. So I think companies are gradually in the 30% club chairman realized they were early adopters although they might not have put it like this that the balance of masculine and feminine qualities and energies was a better result in the boardroom than just one or the other. And I think this gives a great opportunity, um, not least for the next generation, because I feel, you know, in all honesty, I would not necessarily want my daughters to follow my path, because I took, I'm, I didn't compromise my beliefs, but I, I ended up um, compromising how I would want to work and behave at work, often to fit in enough, to have my seat at the table. And I knew I had to uh, conform enough to, to progress in my career. And now I think actually companies are valuing difference. And so I say, actually, we want people to be coming at the table as themselves. Um, and it's not all over yet. I do not wish to claim that we're completely through to the other side. But I think this is the really big and exciting news because I think it means that, um, that say, our daughters can now not, well, it's not just they can be themselves, but they need to be themselves to really play their part in creating a virtuous circle as companies become more balanced places, more types of people are represented, and in turn, then we can do better things together. Now, at the same time as well, this uh, initiative, the 30% Club, is going global. Um, obviously, all of that um, theory, anyway, applies globally. Um, there is a 30% Club in the US, it started last year. Very excitingly, our initial chairman supporters included Warren Buffett and Larry Fink, and most recently, Sheryl Sandberg. So that's all got other people very excited about it, which is great. Uh, we have one in Hong Kong, uh, there's one in Southern Africa, there's one in East Africa, uh, there's one in Ireland, and um, I think over the next few months, um, Australia, Canada, Malaysia, Japan, India, 
uh, GCC, um, anyway, the list goes on a bit. Italy and Germany, countries with quotas who haven't really made much progress in the pipeline, who get this theory about masculine and feminine energy has been important at every stage. They're embracing it, as well as countries with obviously very difficult situations, Islamic societies, where sometimes the women, you know, it's a long way off, it seems, from equality. So all told, it's a very long way from the starting point that we would just have a few more women on boards. But it's, I think, the true story of the 30% Club. And I'm very happy to take any questions. Oh, I never even did my second chart, did I? Goodness, I had two charts and I missed one off. <laughs> um, so what we've tried to do is create this sort of virtuous circular, sort of wheel of change. What the boards did was, that, and, and in fact it was a very easy um, win in some ways, because several of them said, well look, we've told the headhunters already that we're interested in having more women on boards, and they keep coming back and saying they can't find any. But when we talked to the headhunters, they usually said, well, we can't find the women. And the chairman don't want it anyway. So we solved the, the latter point by saying, actually, now they've signed up to this club, they definitely do want it. And then obviously we've been helping them to try to source more qualified but different qualities to be considered um, for the roles. We've also then brought pressure to bear from shareholders and with corporate governance. So actually now we have fund managers like my company going in and challenging them when they don't have diverse enough boards. So, so I have to say, although it's more of a carrot than a stick approach, there is then some shareholders will vote against um, the nomination committee chair or the chairman of the board if they don't do enough about diversity because there's now recognized to be this linkage between good performance and having diversity. So these are a series of things, but having the leadership at the top, starting with that and them signaling to the world they wanted to have more women on their boards, high quality, qualified candidates, but they would be prepared to look laterally and to broaden the net um, was an important step forward. Yes, there you go. So, so I found a diversity project a couple of years ago um, in Germany for my employer. And what we've actually seen is, even though we've got the women, you know, in a top leadership, not on the board, but the fluctuation rate would increase at that level. So they they would be promoted, we would have women there, and then they would leave. So what do you think, what, what are the cultural aspects that need to be in place to keep them, even though they are very good at their job and you want to keep them, but many choose to leave and maybe focus on their family or kind of choose less stressful jobs. So what do you think needs to be done to keep them there? Well, first of all, I think it's pretty fundamental that the culture of the workplace needs to change so that actually people can contribute and not have to make this sort of binary decision. I think often we seem to work ourselves into such a stress over, you know, you see the amount of energy that's wasted and the amount of aggravation people cause for themselves. And I think that's obviously a very big question for companies about how do they change enough. And I've seen it, you know, many, many times that actually extremely talented women get there and then don't like where, where they find themselves in. So obviously we have to change where they find themselves in. And it is a little bit catch-22 because if they don't stay long enough, they can't change it. So I suppose one of my requests to women often is don't give up just when you kind of get there and you could actually make a difference. I mean, I, I have been in that place myself and sometimes it's been very uncomfortable. You know, you'd be the only woman in the room. I often still am, not necessarily just at my workplace, but in other things that I do. And actually, but I know that if I wasn't there, it would never change, you know, if, and I have to get others to be with me. Um, so I guess, getting an ally for the women who get there, but also then encouraging the companies to also think about how to make sort of gender intelligent policies. Don't just send off the women on the same course if the course is designed around how men tend to uh, react well. Because often that course, because I've seen women be sent on some management training course and then leave at the end of it because they think, oh my God, I don't want to be a manager. Whereas actually, that wasn't the point of the exercise. Obviously the point was to encourage them and do, so actually, and there are different ways of being a leader or a manager. I mean, I do not fix, fit the textbook, you know, leader type image. <laughs> so, gentlemen, next year. Very often, is there going to be any uh, cohort 12 for Vanya? I'm just curious, uh, as the women come into the war room, which is a, a drawing role, as you said, do they incorporate any, from your third percent club, do you incorporate like a set of tools like emotional intelligence or leadership or coaching or anything like that to uh, not only help the women, but also the uh, men they're agreeing with, so they have a, a better or different framework for communication and working together or no? 
Yes, I mean, again, we're not trying to do everything on this journey, but what we do is we're working with um, the, uh, for example, met people the other day that were about a NED internship program where they're tre um, trying to show people what it is like to sit on a board. We work with several of the headhunters to do um, uh, mentoring, but once you've been appointed, so that somebody who's an experienced non-exec can actually help the women to understand the dynamic. Most companies nowadays, because of the financial crisis and other sort of scandals that have happened, spend a lot of time on induction program for their non-execs. And actually, often the chemistry with the chairman and how to get your first contributions as a non-exec is an issue for all new board members. So actually, I think that one is sort of more in transition anyway. It's just that then we suggest that perhaps there's some, you know, some do one-on-one -on -one coaching, some do it just slightly different dynamic to, and obviously I don't want to put every woman in a certain category and every man in a certain category, but recognizing particularly if you're a first time, not as it. So that's something that I should have mentioned actually, that one of the big things, and going back to your question, was that actually in 2012, there were 99 women appointed, it's such a shame, it's not quite 100, but anyway, 99 women appointed to the FTSE and 250 um, size boards. 62 of them were brand new, never had board experience at either level. So, so this is kind of a big ch change. It was a big change for the companies and it was a big change for the women to take on those roles. And, and there are a number of tools, there's, there's certain courses, but also then the companies have learned they need to make sure the women succeed when they get there. Yes. Do you comment on the effectiveness of legal quotas for women on So legal quotas just, they get you more women on boards and quickly, but actually, and, and I think there is a benefit in terms of them, you know, we want to have more women on boards and Norway, actually there was a study out today from Harvard Business Review showing that actually, you know, there, there has been a better board, going back to my point about more diverse boards are, are better, but they don't create sustainable and meaningful change throughout the organization. So in Norway, which is so often held as the poster child of success in quotas, um, I make several observations. Um, one is that uh, the number of the women, um, they told me, they, they were executive managers, they were CEOs, CFOs, and they stopped their executive role and took on non-exec roles. So they actually have a smaller proportion of women in the executive uh, roles now than they did before. So how you make that sustainable and how you work, what happens next after those people on the boards from the first appointments is a, is a problem, I think. So in Norway, they're actually thinking of doing a 30% club. If you look on my Twitter account today, there's a lady in Norway that I've been in touch with. I spoke at Oslo uh, last year, and they're thinking of doing one for the pipeline. The other thing is that companies went around the legislation. So 100, there were 500 companies at the time when the quota legislation was introduced, listed on the stock, Oslo Stock Exchange. 100 delisted, you know, and um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, a fifth of the company is delisted. And... Um, I cannot find an example of a country where they have done this and it's gone and it's trickled down to all levels as well. So, so you know, the getting around the problem by delisting, um, you know, is also something that you'd want to avoid. Um, so, so, yeah. It sounds about less effective than this market strategy approach. Well, my, this, this approach is harder in terms of, like, getting the actual numbers through because, obviously, I mean, where we're on track for now, if you take the turnover rate of... Um, non-exec or, or t directors, including exec positions. If you take the turnover rate and you extrapolate that and the proportion they're going to women, you'd get to somewhere between about 27% by the end of the year. Not quite our 30, but, you know, heck, I'll take it, you know, so to, in the sense it was a long way from 12 um, and a half. But the um, reality is that all of the changes that people have been putting in place to get there are also now impacting, they're now thinking, we must get the executive management through. We must make sure that our female graduates, when they join, are doing this. Do we have a maternity buddy program? Do we have a returnship program for people who've taken time out? I mean, all of the second order things, which are hard work, which take time, they are being put in place. Whereas in Norway, they haven't done any of that because they've just focused on, you know, I mean, I could be unkind to say it's the appearance of change. I think it's a bit more than that, say, because they, they've created a better board dialogue, but it hasn't improved anything below the board. Hi. Um, I just wanted to know what the sort of hurdles you face where, while you're setting up this, this program. And secondly, uh, follow up to that, maybe for other underrepresented groups, whether it's based on ethnic, uh, ethnic, ethnics or, or gender, for example, uh, what would be the advice for, for the second? Great question. So, well, um, 
a lot of hurdles. So I'm making it sound like, oh, so easy. But actually, no. um, there was much rejection, um, particularly in the first time. And I actually naively, I mean, first set of chairman seemed to be quite easy to recruit. And then actually I was told by somebody, they're all very clubby with each other. And one was told, I was told, oh, well, so-and-so was very upset. I asked him. So I thought, oh, I never thought I should ask everybody, like, randomly. So I started writing letters to the 350 companies, and I started, you know, I was working through the alphabet. I started at A, and I got down to HA for Hansen, by which point I was getting letters back from the A's and the B's, basically on the long lines of F off, you know, sort of most <laughs> So I felt a bit disappointed by that reaction, and also I would start my letter saying, this is not a call for a quota, and everyone would start their letter who was negative, saying, I hate quotas, go away. You know, I was like, oh. Not, anyway, so I realized that wasn't a good recruitment thing. Um, and also then often there's, you know, people like to think of reasons um, why not to do things. So often when you approach people, they come up with all sorts of reasons why not. But I've realized that anybody, if I'm just doing this because I care about it and I think it needs to be resolved and now we seem to have momentum and that makes it much easier. But actually any change is bound to be difficult, otherwise it would have been, would have happened already. On ethnic minorities and other forms of, and what I've seen within, say, for example, BMI Mellon, is that the women's initiative started and then it encouraged other, you know, we have a disability group, we have ethnic minority, we have LGBT groups, and they kind of came in behind. Now, what, I, what I'm slightly worried about is the idea that has been floated um, uh, in this country is having another sort of a target for ethnic minorities on boards and then presumably targets for other groups because the logical sort of conclusion of this is that, the, I mean, a board is not a boy band or a, you know, I mean, we're not trying to manufacture it. So I think what I'd love to see is people, and what I do think has happened, and some of the chairmen say, look, now we think of candidates, what makes a suitable candidate quite differently. We will look for, we want other types of other. We want cognitive diversity. We want different educational backgrounds. We want different family and social backgrounds. We want ethnic range. We want people from different nationalities. So I think what, has happened is now people are saying, okay, well, look, gender's just the starting place. We now need to be more thoughtful about what a good board looks like in terms of characters and different backgrounds. Now, I do think that um, it's not a question of just leave it at that and hope it all happens. I mean, Third Percent Club now is doing joint events with other groups. So, for example, there's an, a group called Outstanding, which recognizes senior business leaders who've come out and who've <laughs> who got to the top of their career and who then um, encourage others to, to to do the same. And so we're doing a joint event in September with them and uh, Lord Brown, um, who was at BP, obviously, and Carolyn McCall, who is a CEO of EasyJet, are sharing their different experiences of, you know, things that have happened to them along the other ways. And we will continue to look for opportunities. Our mentoring program now, we're offering people a chance to take, you know, the ethnic background and whether they want to raise that as an issue with a mentor, whether they want a matched mentor, uh, etc. So I'm really keen to work with other groups, but I actually think we just have to be careful that it doesn't become a series of targets. And, and to be honest, if I said, if, given where we are now, if we were starting and it had happened without the 30% Club and other initiatives, I wouldn't set up a 30% Club now because we're already so far in the developing it. But we needed, you know, sometimes you need something for the moment, you know. But it's, yeah, it's, uh, I mean, to be honest, the bigger challenge, I think, is having, um, a, a, make sure that there is, going back to the pipeline of talent, that you've got really great talent um, from all backgrounds as well. Because, again, you've got to, you know, get people from the boards if you've developed people as executive leaders as well. Oh, my goodness. That's a, okay, we'll start here and we'll work around. <laughs> What's the impact on the uh, company's performance when you increase the number of women uh, on the board? Well, I have a lovely document in my bag, written by Credit Suisse, which looks at 3,000 companies around the world. And it's overwhelming because I actually read it and you thought, oh, it's kind of too good. Every single criteria. Now, we never made a big thing out of, you know, put some women on the board and suddenly the financial performance is better. But five, six studies now have been done on different parts of the world. The Credit Suisse one is powerful because it's global and it's looking at the management levels as well. But um, McKinsey has done several in the US, Catalyst in the US, Citigroup in Australia, Socgen in Europe, um, and um, Credit Suisse has done a couple, the most recent being this one. And what they show is every sort of financial metric is improved. Now, you, if you just have one token 
woman, uh, it doesn't really work. You have to have, in fact, Sok Jens had this line in their report that said, is 30% the magic number? And I was so excited. I called them up. You know, we've been going for a while. And I said, so where did you get that from? They said, oh, we just chucked in the data. And 30% came out as the one where which was the tipping point. But every, I mean, the study from Credit Suisse is amazing. It's got one page of all the financial ratios, which shows everything from dividend payout ratios to divestitures to doing crazy M&A stuff that doesn't really work. And it's overwhelming. I mean, it's just, I spoke to the CFA Society in Toronto the other day, 250 investors, and they were asked, um, not by me, by the preceding speaker, did they think that gender balance improved financial performance of companies? 93% said yes, Seven, the other 7% were neutral. The, exact, the immediate follow-up question was, do you include an analysis of gender mix in your financial uh, assessment of company? Only 25% said yes. So we're obviously completely lunatic, really, and don't make any sense at all. Not connecting the dots. So, yeah, it's pretty overwhelming. But it is those, if you have no women in, at the top, and then if you have 30%, it's in between, it's kind of not really something to make too much about. Did you have a question as well, since I'm working? Yeah, I would have a, a small question. So I, uh, I'm, I'm Danish, sure my answers. <laughs> yeah, I'm Danish and I come from, uh, I live in Sweden now, so gender is a big issue, especially in Sweden. Mm -hmm. And there's a big discussion, should the state regulate, i.e. should politics decide, you know, quotas and it goes further into maternity, paternity leave, the split mm -hmm. between them, the total amount available to the couple and all that. It sounds to me like you are not advocating that rule. Mm -hmm. Would that be correct? That's correct, yeah. I mean, I'm very, I think that obviously there's so many differences, say, between Sweden, Denmark, and here in terms of the way society works. And I have spent a bit of time there, and I've talked to a lot of people um, there. And I, I think it's quite difficult to compare and contrast because obviously there's a lot of different expectations of how the government um, and individuals fit together. I think certainly in the culture here that, that we need people to feel they believe in it and do it. I mean, we have, you know, we have bad track record. There were something like 6,000 rules in the FSA's handbook and we still have the financial crisis and all sorts of manner of ill doing. Uh, you, know, you have to kind of believe in it and to actually do something. I think that things that the government are doing around shared parental leave here are helpful in terms of breaking down the gender sort of box, you know, people being put in boxes and I know that nobody would ever admit it but I'm sure companies think twice about hiring a childbearing age woman versus a man if everything else is equal. And to break that down um, and to, to, to make it much more, I mean, the logical conclusion of all of this work should be that men, as well as women, have more choices. Um, my husband said he enjoys being at home and he thinks that other men would like to, but don't feel that they can from society. So, so I, I think that the background can be constructive or unhelpful, but that ultimately people have to do it for themselves, really. Uh, now everybody's asking a question, so <laughs> just send me a postcard. I'll go for that lady on the right jumper there. First of all, what I think you're doing is amazing here, and I'm 17, so it's really exciting. For me, it's really exciting to see what you're doing. For me, in my generation, it's really exciting to see what you're doing. For me, in my generation, when oh, thank I'm you for coming and listening. And well, getting <laughs> in it, you know, young recruits. So. <laughs> um, and my question for you would be, um, if you could give advice the, you know, 20-year-old you, before you step out into business, what would it be? So I, I think I was probably missing one of the genes that, or dimensions that a lot of women suffer from, but I do recognize that I, as well as lots of other women, tend to hold ourselves back by analyzing a situation rather than going for it. And it's, um, I mean, I've had young women come to me who maybe they say, well, I've, got, I've been going out with my boyfriend for three years now. We're thinking of getting married. We're, think, we're thinking of getting engaged. And maybe three years' time we'll get married. And then I'm thinking of having a baby. And I've just been offered a promotion. Should I take it? I mean, this is a true story. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> so I think you're overthinking it. You know, so sometimes I think we're told, you know, and I think women, we do, we are conscientious. We try to think of what might go wrong. Are we good enough? Do we kind of have that sort of rather than go for it? And I think often, I mean, my philosophy has to be, because I have so much going on in my life, one step at a time, bit, and not to be panicked by, you know, the week ahead, let alone the month or year ahead. I fit sort of out to that. I don't always succeed in not being um, overwhelmed by, active, by all my things going on. But actually, we have to somehow, I think we're more capable of more than we tend to give ourselves credit for. Yes. I'm an academic, so 
Yes, I did speak at the Royal. Actually, Newton hosted a charity seminar at the Royal College of Surgeons. And after, in the break, I don't, I've interrupted your question now. In the break, this lady said to me, I want to show you something. She had this big bunch of jangling keys. And she took me to the ladies' room. I thought, oh my God, I've been kidding. What am I having? <laughs> and she said, and she took me through the door. And then she took me through another door. And then there was this teeny little room, which you probably know well, which had one little wicker chair in it. And she said, these are the facilities for the lady surgeons out of town. Uh, for, for our sort of, you know, recreational <laughs> activities. The men have a billiards room, a bar, and <laughs> she wanted to show me. She said, well, it's because we've only got three or something. So, yes. <laughs> I suppose that you have. So, I mean, the, the College of Surgeons currently mm. has its first woman president. Um, but, in fact, the proportion of women consulting surgeons is still at about 5%. And here at the university, they're probably only quite So I have had a meeting with Dame Sally Davis, the Chief Medical Officer, who is very keen to join forces again do this. She's obviously a great supporter of the Athena Swan accreditation, which I think is brilliant because it means people only get the money if they're delivering certain things. She's particularly talked about academic uh, research and medical field. Um, and in fact, actually only yesterday we were saying we must go back and say, well, what's the, what's the plan? Well, how should we do this? But yes, I mean, we do have public sector organizations. I also think that this is kind of something where we're obviously the ones trying to kind of so you sort of walk to, together, you know, arm in arm, kind of get this shifted and get girls thinking they could be academic surgeons or surgeons or research scientists and trying to um, do this. But I know she cares greatly about it. It's just we don't have a specific program on it yet. Okay. Big round now. <laughs> um, I've noticed one, one field where, where we have the, the, the training is a bit different in, in social investment than any back in that um, whether it's in the practice or even in the classroom, um, and when we look at some of the executive education programs, is there's a significant proportion of women. Mm -hmm. um, and I was wondering if, you, if that's something that you can into to also understand why that is. And um, it seems that women are also really taking leadership roles and um, in the place. So McKinsey did a great piece of work called, um, the, the, sort of on um, what, I what was it called? Like women, women matter. So, but it was on the conclusion was that women need work with meaning or want work that has meaning. I'm sure men do too. But anyway, they're saying it was more important to women to do something with your life that actually had some impact on the world and meaning that it meant something. And it tends to mean that then women would. I mean, there's more a high percentage of women on boards and, and executive management teams of charities, but also in um, social impact investing. Um, now, I say I think it's a bit stereotypical. I think probably it's um, something that men would enjoy doing as well. And again, uh, one of the things we're trying to do, I suppose, is break down the sort of sense that it's one or the other. But I think that's what's going on there, that women are very much attracted by the idea of doing something that would have an impact as well as perhaps be lucrative. Yes. So uh, my company was recently acquired by Schneider Electric, and I see that Schneider Electric is part of the 30% club, which is news to me. Um, I don't see a lot of transparency in my company that they're doing anything, although I did hear that they wanted to increase uh, the leadership roles to 30%. How can I act as an agent of change? Well, why don't we talk in the break after? Because they've only, they've only recently joined. And um, again, this is often what happens is that the chair or the CEO sign up, and then they start thinking, oh, what should we do now? And so we try to help, obviously, with a series of sort of programs offering things like the cross-company mentoring, offering opportunity to pair with others in the sector and so forth. So yeah, let's, um, I'll give you my card and we'll work out how to do it. OK. Yes. A similar question to, to Janet. When you're sort of in an organization that has the interest to really promote women, there's still kind of a disconnect with people asking, like, oh, it's great to have a woman in the room. It's great to have a woman at the table. And you know, how do you respond to those sort of, they're happy you're there, but then it's sort of uncomfortable that you've been called out on it. You know, what, what can we do to kind of <laughs> explain that? Of course, right here, you know, it, it's yeah. kind of a weird. It is. It is uncomfortable. I mean, actually, I've had um, 
Some feedback from a kid. I mean, the Thirty Percent Club is about men and women working together, but in some of our groups, it's predominantly women. And then if there's one man in the room, he goes, "Oh my God, I haven't realised before how daunting that would be," you know. Um, and um, I, th I think, to be honest, it's hard. I mean, I sometimes feel, you know. And I chair the investment association, which represents all the fund management groups. And I mean, there's one other woman on the board, but often she's not there. So the last board meeting, which is a five hour number, I'm the only woman. And, and I know at one stage I did something that meant that um, it was, I, I, I'm now going to feel I have to tell the story and I don't want to tell the story. Anyway, I, I sort of lost my temper, basically, um, with some point that was going round and round in circles. And actually, I thought, oh, damn, does that make me think of me differently because I'm the woman here? Actually, to be honest, I. Re in all honesty, I reacted in a slightly masculine way because I, I did it. And actually, it kind of got me more credit, I think, from the rest of the group, but it wasn't intended. Um, but yes, it's a difficult one. And I think actually, we sometimes do have to be sitting there in the uncomfortable situation and remembering that we're doing this, you know, it's a little bit pay it forward. You know, it's kind of. How do you respond? How do I respond? Well, I sometimes make it slightly lighthearted, say, oh, it's a shame it's only me, or it's a shame it's only one of us, you know, or just to make it. I mean, I don't think one can, I kind of try to move on quickly and just say, yeah, it's um, but it'd be better if there were two, or, you know, something like that. It's, um, one ends up having to not develop a thick skin because I think it's important to be yourself and sensitive as you need, but to not internalize it too much or worry about someone saying it and then feel embarrassed. It's easier said than done. Yes, Lee. <coughs> yeah, great to talk tonight. Can I just ask, I, I, I I'm very persuaded by your argument that quotas are a blunt instrument and that cultural change is more deep-rooted, more thoroughgoing of organisations. But one of the concerns I have is that you can have the chairperson or the leader of an organisation, a VC in a university, who is, is, is a champion of progressive <coughs> ideas and, and the top bit of the management of an organisation is, you know, I think some um, tools that help you get there, but actually make people feel they are still having an involvement in, in whether they do it or not, are, are powerful. I mean, I think one thing that's quite an even slightly softer than that one is, you know, hardwiring into people's goals for the year. You know, making sure that when you said, "Have you have you been inclusive?" doesn't mean yes, I was nice to everybody. You tick the box yourself, mm -hmm. but you actually have to demonstrate what you did, and you demonstrate that when you have a slate of candidates for a job, you have presented, you've thought about the diversity. There may be nobody who's qualified for it, but you um, you can present the evidence for it. And actually what I've seen, because we did a big, we've done a big piece of work with professional services firms who have obviously this problem in extremis, in the sense it's often over 50% women at the start and then the 15% at the top. And um, what we found there was exactly the point you made, that the, the, all the managing partners had made it to one of their top three goals of their tenure and then you left their office, and we did a big survey involving hundreds of people, men and women, and you left their office and commitment just fell away. So actually three quarters of the people immediately one level down, so they didn't think diversity was relevant in terms of the bottom line. So we kind of then, they went back to them and they said, well, we're going to have to actually have targets over the female partner promotions. And so I think even though you don't want to have, I suppose, it's the same sort of thing, you know, get so harsh and that you end up with effectively rules anyway, it has had an impact that everyone starts thinking, actually, I'm going to be judged badly if I don't do this. Um, obviously, again, you can't have a quota on some jobs that require technical skills. You have to get, I mean, some, I once told me, said, well, I'm an FX trader. I'm head of the FX desk at a big uh, global bank. And he said, I've only got 7% women, but I couldn't make somebody a head trader because they're all junior. You know, you can't have a quota for, mm -hmm. for every single role. But some, some things that actually make hold people's feet to the fire 
I think are important and it's and it's not black or white that it's just I don't think having a law then saying you've done everything go away go home and everything's fixed is the answer Oh, I think people are now finally fatigued. Yes. <laughs> you have talked a lot about benefits of having women on board. What about the cost side? And here I mean the cost side for women who take up your challenge and want to rise to the top. Do they need to give up anything? <laughs> Not everybody can have a very understanding husband. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I was once on a panel with someone and she was asked by the audience what was their biggest advice and she said, well, marry well. And that came across all wrong because it implied <laughs> that. But I knew what she meant. Um, I think, I mean, once I was asked on, on television, live television, this interviewer kept saying, do I think really that people could combine two careers in the household and, you know, still you know, have children and doing stuff. Anyway, she kept going on, I kept answering the question, thinking, why are we stuck on this question? And afterwards, it came off air, and then um, one of the producers said, I'm sorry she kept going on about that. She's just about to get married. And she and her, <laughs> husband, she and her husband are arguing over who's going to stay at her or downshift their career. So it all made sense. I think, I mean, if you had nine children, I don't know how logistically we could have done it if, if we'd both been. I mean, when we, up until we had our fourth, we, we never had live-in help, so we'd be arguing who'd be going home for the nanny first and that sort of thing and definitely was Im important for our quality of family life that we had that but I do think I mean when we did the professional services firms work we asked the women what they whether they thought that work had to be number one priority to get partner status and we asked the men that and I think it was 79% of the women said it did and it was in the 50s of the percent of the men thought that I think sometimes again we we think we can't do that I'm not claiming it's plain sailing and I'm not saying you can we can do everything all of the time and obviously all of us are human beings but I do think it's worth you know putting the one step in front of the other and seeing where that takes you yes can you just talk a little bit more about the schools program and what impact mm. you hope to have in the schools on your outcome given that there's kind of a perceived gap between where yeah. a 15 six year old and, and sort of visualizing what might be looking like yeah so I guess this goes back to the whole pipeline thing that if you don't start, I mean, often at school, our perceptions are set and, you know, it it's kind of ends up being too late. You know, girls haven't taken up physics GCSE, so they can't do one of the STEM subjects. So you kind of, I've ended up realizing we can't just wait until people join a company because often then their preconceptions are there and, and also their, their choices of career. So what I, I, I had spoken a few years ago on Speakers for Schools and afterwards I thought, um, what, you know, I looked on the website and realized that if I was a school selecting a speaker, there was nothing on encouraging girls to consider a wide range of career choices. There was nothing on importance of gender equality in the schoolroom and, and beyond. And so I spoke to Robert Peston about whether he thought it would be additive to what they had already. And he said, oh, yeah, we should, you know, that definitely we should do that. So what it is now, we did a blitz in, in January. We're doing another one in November where we do a concentrated couple of weeks. Um, in between, it's sort of business as usual, so it's on the website. Schools can go select a speaker. They have 800 speakers already on Speakers for Schools. We've added more speakers to their roster, and you can select quite a few people who would say, yes, I can talk about that. Now, obviously, measuring it is quite difficult in terms of, um, and in fact, for all the Speakers for Schools things, they haven't been able to necessarily measure the impact. But I've done, I mean, in January, I did two, spoke at two schools myself. And the questions were brilliant, but also talking to the students, you could see that actually, including the boys, I mean, it was very interesting. One school was a girls' school up until sixth form, then it was mixed, and the other school was a boys' school up until sixth form, and then it was mixed. Very different questions, but you see that everyone's quite insecure about their future. Everybody's in that stage of sort of, what do I do? And the idea of somebody perhaps not fitting their conventional thinking about, I mean, someone in the city or a working mother of nine children or you know some of the it just kind of makes something a little bit more broadly and all I mean Brenda you've spoken at school haven't you and probably can share your experience as well so I, I think some of this is actually throwing lots of stuff out there and thinking if one or two women girls think differently about what they can do that would be worthwhile and I do get letters and things from uh, which is always very nice when um, uh, particularly young people write and they say, "Oh, I was going to do this," and then I sort of read something and I thought I could do that. You know, I could, I could increase my, you know, set my sights higher. Or somebody in the middle of their career who's not given up just because they encounter some difficulty. I also always talk about resilience. I haven't mentioned that at all, and actually that would have been a good point to raise from the um, 
a, a yeah, lady next to you, um, because the, um, I think often we talk about equality at school or people just expect it. And then when you hit a roadblock, like I did in my career, then often people are, are quite, or personalize it. So often I talk about, you know, it's not all solved. Don't take it all to heart, you, you know, um, and it might not be about you, but more the, the situation that we're all in still. Yes, Karen. You mentioned earlier being overwhelmed at times. Uh, I'm what, what is it that must often makes you overwhelmed and how you deal with it? So, this is where now I think, how personal do I get here? Um, so I think, I mean, usually for me, it's the combination of, you know, lots of children with obviously lots of needs and um, wanting time and energy, and so they should, because that's, you know, that I'm their mom. And then some competing thing that I have a deadline or I have something that I'm not quite on top of at work and things that I know. So it's just the same, only bigger scale probably than every working mother would, or father probably goes to at some point. And um, I guess I've learned to be less sort of harsh on myself um, in terms of knowing that I can only do the best I can. Um, but then just sometimes you look ahead and you think, oh my goodness, there's not enough. Well, certainly in our case, there's not enough parents to go around. And, um, and you know, that sometimes there may be a problem, you know, at work or a family that then you kind of feel that you'd really want to ideally drop everything else and focus only on on that. And, and to be honest, it's been slightly overwhelming, but in a good way, having 30% club sort of mushroom. And then, you know, for a while, there was barely a day we went by when another country were to get in touch. And we'd be like, <laughs> no. And that only works again with finding a really great leader on the ground and, you know, setting that up. So yes, it's, um, it's the same issues that probably make everybody else feel overwhelmed from time to time. And uh, fortunately, I, I have learned, fortunately or unfortunately, I can't think what the word is, um, that actually the feeling of overwhelmed is probably the worst thing, being overwhelmed, that actually it makes it less likely that you can see your way through. And trying to battle that one is important. Helena, we're probably going to move outside. Yes, in a I was thinking, so must be time for a drink soon. <laughs> so if you'd like to take one more. Last question. question, going, going. All right, now we've got to, well, let's take them both and I'll try and answer quickly. So you first, because. So um, you mentioned you're going to India. Yeah. Um, uh, I was amongst the seven women directors in India in 1991. Uh, and uh, now we have a function action. Mm -hmm. And I'm a working woman director in uh, a large company. And um, um, I just would like to ask you to read <laughs> Maybe we'll pick up if you can stay for the drinks and you can tell me about your direct experience because this has come now from, in, again, we're not kind of rushing out saying we want to impose ourselves on you. Lots of, com several companies, a, um, I guess a handful of companies have approached us and said we, we think it could be helpful here. And um, I have been in conversation in the past with somebody who took your position um, who is Indian. I actually do have a piece of work which I've commissioned from Judge Business School, sorry. Um, and who, and she's Indian and, and has been quite helpful, but very interested in your perspective. I'm always willing to learn. It's, it's fair to say that people want to take on the initiatives as well, as opposed to just yeah. the overriding 30% of the only initiatives that have been developed out of it. Yes, it's not just saying there's a philosophy, you've got to impose that, and that's the only way to work forward. It's saying this is a series of, of actions that can be taken that seem to combine together to make an impact. But yeah, let's chat about that. And you can have the final word then. Yes. <coughs> Ask a question. Actually, um, I'm coming from the socialist world, country background. Actually, socialist and uh, socialism played quite with the political role and women and um, men equality. And of course, not only not for the comporter, it's a more kind of that women and uh, men is equal and feeling and not to work for working mothers. <laughs> what was it pro-choice? The idea of making it illegal not to work, or legal, yeah, not to work, <laughs> seems harsh. But I, again, you know, I've spoken to a number of countries and people have said, actually, you know, obviously your starting point, this piece of work actually is comparing and contrasting different societies around the globe and the balance of, you know, 
barriers, the um, degree to which the culture might be described as masculine or feminine, but also the political sort of dimension. I think that they, they, the interesting thing for me is looking and studying in terms of what are the levers that might be applicable. I mean, I think having a, a communist sort of state, you know, is kind of an extreme way of getting um, gender equality. You know, it's not the society we live in, and it's, you know, but maybe there are elements of that in terms of people being treated equally that we could learn from. I certainly found that looking at some of the emerging markets, that actually one of my thoughts is that actually sometimes where the econ economic growth is more at an earlier stage and you're seeing a big build up now in entrepreneurship and development of business culture, that actually often women are taking quite a leading role. I mean, you've seen that obviously in Africa and in talking to people at the EBRD. You know, there's lots of um, female entrepreneurs in a lot of countries that are rising up. And, and it does strike me as a very different set of questions when you've got an established market that you're trying to change the culture than if you're trying to build one. And maybe some countries have a bit of an advantage over us now. So Japan is, you know, one where they're one of 30% but they've only got 1% women on boards now, which is <laughs> when I feel overwhelmed. <laughs> so, on that note. Helen, thank you so much. <laughs> Pleasure. Thank you. And how do social movements get started? Uh, they take a lot of people. Um, but sometimes it takes one person to ignite these. And uh, we are really thrilled that you could join us tonight. But we also have to play our part. Uh, you know, there's a lot of things we're doing around the school. But the one thing I would like to point to is that we think there's lots more women in the Oxford community that should be serving on boards. Um, and we're running a program. And Catherine, if you'd like to say a word about it in a few weeks, to, uh, Captain Quinn, by the way, the Chief Operating Officer. <laughs> <laughs> I to do that throughout. Uh, good evening, everybody. I'm Chief Operating Officer of Side Business School, and the Ember 12s. I look forward to meeting you uh, in person, and maybe tonight, but certainly in the course of the next few weeks. Um, now, I came up to uh, Oxford from London, where I was working, about a, just over a year ago. And um, there are many stark differences between Oxford and London, as, as many of you will know. One of them is you can walk across town here. Another one, though, is that in London, um, there's a very vibrant live conversation going on about women on boards, about women's career developments across all sectors. And this has been largely led by Helena and other colleagues, uh, Anne Richards, uh, uh, Chief Investment Officer at Albany Asset Management, and a whole group of very impressive and encouraging women uh, across London. Um, when I came to Oxford, I couldn't hear that conversation. Uh, it was so quiet that um, it didn't come to my attention. So along with Cathy Harvey, uh, we've decided to hold a, a workshop at the school about women and boards to encourage the many talented women in Oxford, the many talented students, alumni, faculty, and those associated with the university, to think about it, to start thinking about the possibilities. And so we're holding a workshop on the 3rd of March, it's a Tuesday evening. We start at 5.30 with a cup of tea, and then we've got a lovely panel of speakers. We've got the diversity uh, lead from Ernst & Young coming. We've got three headhunters, one from the corporate, who does corporate headhunting, one who does not the profit headhunting, and one who works specifically to place women into non-executive and executive positions in corporates. Uh, and finally, uh, we have uh, another speaker from a very lively young organization called Women on Boards, which has a fantastic website, which lists a whole bunch of uh, uh, possibilities for getting onto boards. And I would encourage you to have a look at that. Um, if you'd like to attend on the 3rd of March, uh, those of you who are in the Ember class, please let Kathy know, and, and we can register you through the Ember class. Those of you who aren't embers, uh, come and have a chat with me now at the drink session or drop um, the events organisers a line here at the school. Drop me a line. My name is Catherine Quinn and we'll make sure that you're registered for the event. But please do come if you're free on the 3rd of March. We'd love to see you. Thank you. And mostly thank you for having us today. But again, we're, you know, we can do our little bit and uh, I look forward to seeing some of you uh, on March 3rd. Thank you so much. Everybody's welcome to come outside for drinks and, uh, and to ask more questions. <laughs>